This is Dr. Mobin Sayed from FLCCC with one more episode of Long Story Short. Today the discussion is going to be about the dandelions. So these are the weeds, yes. And we use so much chemicals and services to kill these weeds. Today the discussion, the research is it's an in vitro study, not in vivo, not in animals, in vitro study in which they tried the aqueous, that is water, aqueous extract of the dandelion leaves, leaves, not the flower, not these little things or not the roots. The dandelion leaf extract is what they used and they looked at its efficacy to reduce the attachment of spike protein with the ACE2 and they found it to be quite effective again in vitro. So let's have that discussion. So first let me show you the paper in vitro effect of Traxicum officinale leaf aqueous extract on the interaction between ACE2 cell surface receptor and SARS-CoV-2 spike protein D614 and 4 mutants. So D614 being the original variant and then 4 mutants. This paper was actually shared with me by Dr. Paul Merrick. So thanks to him. He is forever researcher. He's always finding things that would help patients and humanity. And I remember when I was having this discussion, something that struck me was that I said there are many other therapies as well. And he said, well, I want to make sure that there are cheaper, readily available therapies that we can look into. So again, this is an in vitro study, but that is the background of all of this. So let's look at this study with my drawings. So dandelion leaf extract helps reduce ACE2 and spike protein binding in vitro study. The high molecular weight compounds. What does this mean? So what the researchers did was, first of all, they took the extract, the whole leaf extract, and they put that in the cells where they put the spike proteins as well. And they observed that the spike protein binding with ACE2 was less. Then what they did was, they centrifuged the leaf extract. And that caused the extract to become split into two parts. One was the high molecular weight components or heavy components and the other one were light components. They then tried to narrow down that which parts of the leaf were more effective. And they found out that high molecular weight compounds were more effective. Now, if we would do further research, then within the high molecular weight compounds, we'll start figuring out further that what are the list of compounds, and then we'll go one by one to see which compound. They didn't go that far, but they went up to the point of saying, High molecular weight compounds in the water-based extract helps reduce ACE2 and spike protein interaction in vitro. So summary in vitro. So here, this is a cell type HEK293. I think we are all aware of it. This is human embryonic kidney cell line. This was modified to exhibit human ACE2 receptors on it. So these ACE2 receptors on it are human ACE2 receptor. Well, this whole line is human line as well. Then what they did was in the same petri dish, in the same well where these cells were present, they also added high molecular weight compounds from the dandelion leaf extract. And what was the definition of high molecular weight compounds? These were the compounds that were more than 5K or kilodeltons. So these were placed in the same wells. And then what they did was they placed spike protein from these four mutants plus the original variant plus they also placed so they had created a pseudo virus they took lentivirus which is also sort of a rounded enveloped virus and then they changed it to express spike proteins on it but this lentivirus didn't have the capability of infecting or replicating but the spike protein was able to bind to ace2 so that was a virus that was a replacement of sars-cov-2 and as they put these together, they observed the results. And as I said before, they observed that less spike proteins were able to connect with the cell. How less? We'll discuss that later. This is a summary of it. Then they also took one more cell line. This was A549, human ACE2 plus human TMPRSS2. These are actually lung cells line. And this cell line was human ACE2 plus it also had TMPRSS2. But can you see this little guy over here? This is the TMPRSS2 on the surface of a cell. TMPRSS2's function is to prime a spike protein so the virus can infect the cell. 
So this is kind of a whole setup. And again, they placed the aqueous extract there. They placed the virus, the lentivirus with the spike protein and just the spike proteins. And once again, they observed the binding or reduced binding. So that means they checked it out in two types of cell cultures. Now, what variants and what mutations? So the variants were alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Omicron was not tested because this research was done before Omicron. And the mutations that were part of these variants, N501Y, 614G, 417N, 484K, 681R. These were the mutations that were present. And of course, they had the wild type virus as well, or not the whole virus, the spike protein. And then I'm sure that the next question for you for the summary will be, what was the extract? What was the dose? What did they do? So that leaf extract, the dose, they did not have a specific dose for SARS-CoV-2 infectivity. Instead, what they recommend in their paper is what European Scientific Cooperative on Phytotherapy suggests. So I think that is their cooperative for herbal medicine. And then there is a Commission E as well in Europe that also governs these things. So 4 to 10 grams. So they're normal. If you look at this dandelion in my hand, their normal advice for therapy for other reasons, not for SARS-CoV-2, is 4 to 10 gram thrice daily or 20 to 30 milligram per milliliter hot water sort of a tea. That is what is the normally advised concentration. The contraindications are very important. Now, it is also interesting that you'll see in the contraindication that the liver issues are a contraindication, although at the same time, there are some cultures, for example, here in the US, the Native Americans use dandelion extracts for liver problems. But anyways, these contraindications are from the European Medicine Agency, so EMA. What are the contraindications? Contraindications are if you are hypersensitive to a sterase plant family or its compounds or similar plants. Then if somebody who has liver and biliary diseases, examples, bile duct obstruction, gallstones, cholangitis, active peptic ulcer, which is not the bile duct or liver disease, but separately active peptic ulcers. That means that these extracts could be irritants and so they could aggravate the ulcers. And finally, this plant or weed, herb, is rich in potassium. It is actually rich in many vitamins as well, for example, A, B, C, D as well. But potassium is quite a lot in it. So that means anybody who has an issue with increased potassium level, for example, bleeding disorders or people who are on the drugs like warfarin and others, they should be very careful with it. So this consuming dandelion could cause hyperkalemia. Also, there is no data under 12 years of age or for pregnant women or for lactating women, positive or negative. There is just no data. So there is no recommendation for these three categories. Now, some interesting clinical observations. Again, this is an in vitro study. So from this study, you cannot say that they were practicing this on people. So there is nothing clinical here. But there were some clinical correlates or indicators that the authors brought to surface. These were, and these are on page 10 of the paper I showed you. Number one, they saw that in the presence of the dandelion leaf extract, the ACE2 enzyme action or activity was not affected. So that means if somebody is taking dandelion leaf extract, their ACE2 should generally be functional. So they're not going to block them to a point of becoming non-functional. The second thing which is more concerning, the first thing is more positive. The more concerning is that they definitely did see that ACE2 enzymes became down-regulated. Now, this is a process for many of our receptors. And that is that when they bind to their ligands, ligands are the things that bind with the receptors. When they bind with the ligands, then the ligand and the receptor, number one, they do their action. They cause their second messenger within the cell and the cell does something. Plus, this whole thing is pulled back into the cell to be recycled. And so, down regulation can occur for the recycling purpose. 
The second reason for down regulation could be that the cell would say, man, I am bombarded with these signals. I better reduce the number of windows or receptors responding to this signal. Otherwise, I will be overwhelmed. So it would down regulate the enzyme for some time. So they did see the down regulation. Now the down regulation can be a positive thing, is to or negative thing. Why could it be positive in the acute disease? ACE2 is the receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 is using to bind with our cells and then to infect them. So if we reduce the availability of ACE2, then of course less infectivity would occur. That is logical as a mechanism. So if we have some substance, some molecule that can intervene or and interfere with the virus binding to ACE2, of course that substance, that molecule would cause reduced infectivity. So that is a positive outcome of a down-regulated ACE2 because the ACE2 enzyme is just not present and the ones that are present, they may be interfered by the dandelion leaf extracts. On the other hand, this can be negative as well. And why this is negative? We know that there is a balance between ACE and ACE2. And what happens is ACE enzyme activity is pro-inflammatory activity. And we have done these discussions in the past. ACE2 enzyme activity is anti-inflammatory activity. So normally in our body, ACE and ACE2 and their activity is in a balance. So if you artificially take ACE2 out of the game, then the result will be that ACE will be more active, but the counterbalance from ACE2 will not occur and the body's inflammatory state will be enhanced, which can be bad. So that is the good and bad of down-regulated enzymes. So does that give for physicians, for example, does that give a clue here what to do next? No, that simply means this can be good and this can be bad. That also means there is going to be research needed. So probably first research will be to repeat this and verify that this study is repeatable then to do animal studies, then to bring it to humans. But these are researches to be needed. Then there is one more clinically important point. I really love this point. It only needed a very short period of time for the cells to be exposed to dandelion leaf extract to have the effect of reduced spike protein binding. Very short period. Actually, you'll see 30 seconds to one minute. And not only 30 second to one minute exposure was sufficient to start reducing the block or start blocking the interaction of ACE2 and spike protein, but that was also sufficient to remove the already attached spike proteins to ACE2. So it could be, again I'm saying could be because this is not a clinical study. From a mechanism point of view, it could be good for prophylaxis and could be good for acute disease as well. Now, how good? We'll actually look at the data a little later in this discussion. Then they also said well, a very interesting thing and that was, so here is a clinical picture. Imagine that we have proved that dandelion is useful. Imagine that this can help reduce ACE2 and spike protein interaction. So imagine if somebody is exposed to another person who may have COVID or you suspect they have COVID. Imagine you have dandelion leaf extract with you. You just squish it or gargle with it or chew it. The question will be, will saliva inactivate this substance? And they found out saliva does not inactivate this substance. The enzymes in the saliva do not destroy it. That's a very good news. And then that also means a brief period of time during which some dandelion extract can be in our mouth after the exposure it would reduce the infectivity. It is mechanistically possible. So that is also a very interesting clinical observation. So the summary of the whole discussion is done. We now know what part of the dandelion plant. It is the leaf extract, these little leaves. High molecular weight part is more important in them. Then we also know the dosage. We also know this contraindication side effects and which categories are not actually included in any knowledge of this plant and then how this plant's behavior has been. 
what variants has been tested and what spike protein mutations have been tested. Now we're going to go in the details of the experiments. So here is what they did. So imagine that these are the two cell types, HEK and 549. So embryonic kidney cells and the lung cells. What they did was they put the leaf extract on them and then they added spike proteins to that leaf extracted, to those cells that were bathed in this leaf extract. And they found that the at 14.9 milligram per milliliter of the leaf extract, the 50% of the effectivity was achieved at this concentration. And as they increased the concentration, the efficacy or activity increased. So this was a concentration bound activity, which is interesting to know. That means you can increase or reduce the concentration to increase or reduce the effect. Then there, of course, the question was, what is in this leaf that is doing this? So they did a more rough structuring instead of actually going down to the every single molecule. What they did was they centrifuged the extract and created two separate parts of it, high molecular weight and light molecular weight, and they wanted to see which one is effective. And what they found out was high molecular weight was more effective than light molecular weight part. That means the compounds in the high molecular weight part, there are some compounds in there that are doing this. So what did they do? They took the bioactive compound, separated them in two fractions, and then they had the high molecular weight. And when they had the high molecular weight, they saw that that was very, very active. And I'll show you the data for how active. And the low molecular weight was not as effective. It was able to start reducing and blocking this spike interaction, but really with less potency. So that was the minor inhibition that it offered. So that means there was something in the high molecular weight part that was doing the action. Then what they did was they pre-incubated the cell. Pre-incubated means they took the cells before they exposed these cells to lentivirus or the spike protein. They incubated them with the extract for how much? For just one minute. This is on their page three and four. One minute. And then they put the spike in there. And then they observed how much blocking occurred. So they saw that the spike binding was blocked by 76.67% plus minus 2.9. That's a huge or a potent efficacy. 76.67% binding was blocked within one minute's exposure. And then as they were looking at the high molecular weight and low molecular weight, high molecular weight fraction was causing 62.5% plus minus 13.4 percent reduction or percent blocking in binding. So if you see overall it was 76.67 and high molecular weight was 62.5. So just another maybe 14 percent was coming from some compounds in the low molecular weight. Now they were comparing this plant to another plant extract as well, leaf extract, and that was I believe Circotium intibus. Let's call it C intibus for now. <laughs> And that, why did they try it with the other plant as well? That plant is also of the same Astraci family. So they wanted to see that, is it the dandelion plant or every plant in this family? And they found out that other plant, at least this other C. intibus plant, did not have as potent of the effect as dandelion leaf extract had. So the C. intibus leaf extract had 37% plus minus 20 binding reduction after one minute of exposure. Now, this is also going to be interesting. The effect of reducing the binding started within 30 seconds of the exposure to the cells. That's beautiful. Then the next question that was in their mind was, is this extract able to replace bound spikes? So if somebody is infected and these spikes are already bound to ACE2, will this extract, the presence of these molecules, somehow compete with already bound spike and remove them. And this is a very well-known mechanism in medicine. We call it competitive inhibition. And what happens is that if there are two types of molecules that both bind to one target, then in some cases, their binding can be influenced 
by the amount or the concentration of one type over the other type. There are other kinds of influences as well, for example, chemical or electromagnetic and so on. But concentration-based influence is also present. So here, a spike that is already bound, if there is aqueous solution of this leaf extract, then that comes and displaces the spike and binds there with the AS2. So that means this can be helpful during an acute disease. Now they also tried, as I said before, they took saliva, human saliva, incubated at 37 degrees centigrade, our mouth environment, and then they put the extract leaf in it with that saliva and 37 degrees, and then they tried it with the spike protein and the cells and the efficacy state. That means some enzymes in the saliva did not attack the extract or the compounds that were active and did not destroy them. That means this extract can be useful to be given not only just orally, but to be given for mouthwashes or gargles. So that's interesting. So then the next question that they had was, will ACE2 binding affect cellular function? So will this leaf extract, whatever compounds are in there, when they will bind with the ACE2 of the cell, will they cause a disruption of cellular function? And as I said before, it did not. And how did they see that? What they did was they took this lung epithelium cell, they exposed it to the leaf extract. Once it was exposed for about 24 hours, one hour to 24 hours, then they lysed the cell. So if you see here, this little diagram of mine, <laughs> I'm pretty proud of this. So this is a scientist standing on a dead cell and looking in. So then they, what they did was they broke the cells, they lysed the cells, and they looked at the enzymes present in the cell to see if these were still functioning enzymes. And they found out that cellular enzymes were still in an active state. That's a good news. Secondly, they found out that ACE2 was down-regulated. That could be good or bad news or a balance, as I discussed before. So then, the researchers had this question that how efficient was pseudovirus transduction, meaning presence of the extract, how efficient it was for this pseudovirus they created to be able to bind with ACE2 and infect. And here is what they found. So they pre-treated these cells with leaf extract. Then they added those lentiviruses with the original C14 spike and with delta spike. And what did they found? They found 85% reduction in binding or transduction at 20 milligram per milliliter extract. And for delta, they found 72% reduction in binding or transduction of this pseudovirus into the cell at 20 milligram per milliliter of the extract. And to put some of this in context, which I think you would appreciate, is that they also tested anti-ACE2 antibodies in the presence of this lentivirus. So they had the cell, instead of the leaf extract, they had the anti-ACE2 antibodies so that these antibodies can bind with ACE2. And then they had the lentivirus. The thing that they wanted to understand was that if the antibodies are present and bound to the ACE2, will the lentivirus be able to displace them, the spikes on that, and bind with the ACE2? And they found out that the binding because of the antibody was reduced by 74% at 100 microgram per milliliter of the antibodies. What is here to appreciate? The thing to appreciate is this. Again, this is in vitro, but still antibodies created a 74% reduction. And dandelion leaf extract created a 72% reduction or 85% reduction of the original variant. Isn't that beautiful? It is a beautiful mechanism to look at and hopefully look at it more from clinical point of view as well. Now the next question for researchers was, which step does the dandelion work on? And I'm sure that this is in your mind as well, that is it good for prophylaxis? If a cell that has never had an exposure to the spike proteins and the dandelion extract is present, will that extract interfere with the new attachments or will it be able to displace existing attachments or will it even be able to hinder already infected cells from allowing the virus to replicate? So they did that. They created three groups of cells. One that were never infected. Second, those who were being transduced with this pseudovirus. 
and third those that had become transduced and then they put them with the dandelion extract and they found out that those that were pre-treated you can think of this as a prophylaxis they had 70 percent reduction in spike binding at 10 milligram per milliliter concentration those that were in the process of being transduced where the virus was attacking them so some of it was bound some of it was standing there and they, it's going to attack them and they put the extract 58 percent reduction in binding plus minus 9.6 that's a pretty good reduction as well for acute disease and then those cells that had become transduced i'll take a bold step to say infected but transduced is the term when they put the leaf extract on them then 53 percent plus minus 8.1 percent was the reduction in spike and lentiform bindings and how did they measure it just for your interest they looked at the luminescence from the lentiviruses as these were attacking these cells and then they measured the amount of luminescence and from there they did this extrapolation so this is the discussion so i would refresh your memory once more because at the end of the day this is what really matters for physicians for researchers the non sars cov 2 dosage for dandelion extracts is 4 to 10 gram multiplied with 3 which means thrice daily or 20 to 30 milligram per milliliter hot water sort of a tea and contraindications as i said before children under 12 pregnant women lactating women there is no data otherwise from the european medicine agency the contraindications are anyone who is hypersensitive to this plant or similar plant families or the compounds of this plant people with liver and biliary diseases for example bile duct obstruction gallstones cholangitis people with active peptic ulcers people who may not be able to tolerate hyperkalemias for example those who are on blood thinners warfarin like drugs so this is the discussion thank you very much for tuning in for listening and learning together and we would see you next week bye bye for now